Um, this is an oral history uh, with Dr. Robert Beislein, and today's date is May 31st, 2005, and we're meeting at the, um, the building that's being um, rented by Department of Energy relating to Rocky Flats closure. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. <laughs> okay. Mountain View facility by okay. the Jefferson County Airport. Great, great. Um, uh, I, we have done an oral history before on, in December 1998 uh, for the Carnegie Library and this oral history will be both for the Carnegie Library collection and for the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum. And I want to thank you very much for doing this again. Thank you. And we'll touch on some things that we talked about before uh, and the transcript of that oral history will be available. So, should we begin first with um, talking a little bit about the buildings uh, as they existed? I guess they don't exist anymore. <laughs> okay. uh, would you mind telling, saying a little bit about the building maybe that you were most familiar with, that you spent most of your time in? in? Okay, uh, the two buildings that I spent most of my time in were buildings 123 and 122 which uh, were basically the buildings for the health physics division and the occupational medicine uh, division uh, and health and safety, uh, devoted to health and safety and uh, studying and, or um, doing the bioassay analysis uh, for the workers uh, and had the lung counting facilities uh, along with the uh, occupational medicine uh, f um, people in, in the 122 buildings. So. And where, they, where were they located in the complex that okay. you just described? The, really? They were in the west, at the west end of Central Avenue, right up next to the administration building, uh, building 111. They were, uh, 122 was across the street from 111, and then uh, 123 was just on, across the street on the east side of, um, of um, 122. So they were, they were toward the west end of the plant site. Mm -hmm. And can you describe, uh, you know, what it was like to go there to work every day? I mean, did you feel, uh, I, I imagine it was very different from the, the worker, the production workers. It was. It was, uh, uh, it was much different in that um, it, was, it was pretty much a routine of, um, of uh, looking after the protection of the workers. And, uh, and so we were really a service organization rather than a production. And uh, we were pro providing service to the worker population there, so it was a little different than than um, the production workers, and and there was a small amount of research associated with health and safety that was being uh, done in those two buildings during that time. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. How did it work when? Uh, now I gather that when. Uh, workers had been contaminated. They were sometimes brought to Correct. one of which buildings? Correct. Um, uh, the workers, uh, there were facilities in building 122. There were f facilities set up to be able to bring workers in that had uh, external skin contamination where they could be brought in and washed and showered and, um, and uh, what we call deconning or de uh, decontaminating those individuals and the facility was set up with, uh, with uh, the capability of monitoring and uh, checking those people for contamination. And then we also had the c equipment there if they did have a, a wound, a surface wound, a cut or an acid burn or some, something of this nature that we could measure the amount of activity and determine whether we needed to d scrub further or maybe Maybe we needed to excise, uh, take a, a little bit of the tissue out uh, there uh, to remove that radio contamination so it didn't get in through the lymphatics and the bloodstream. And then um, we had the lung counting equipment there as well. So, so we had, the, had everything pretty centrally located in, uh, for taking care of the workers if, uh, if they did receive contamination, either externally or internally. And uh, the occupational medicine group was right there. They could, uh, uh, we as health physicists could work right side by side with the physicians. And, and helping them to determine what uh, the best uh, treatment was for those individuals. Yeah. Now, since you were in the health, you didn't actually do the treatment yourself, but you worked alongside. Worked the alongside, yes. I worked alongside the medical people, and uh, 
since my doc doctorate research was dealing with uh, wounds, and it was the only study, in fact, there's a national committee that's now uh, coming out with a publication, National Council on Radiation Protection, that uh, they are using my doctoral dissertation research data for this, uh, for this publication, and uh, it's the only information on human beings uh, and, and on uh, animals that uh, for study, and the only one that really had much information on on um, on wounds, the taking uh, intake of um, of uh, plutonium through wounds, and uh, also during that, I was also treating the uh, animals that we were treating uh, that we were studying, treating them with a chelating agent, which we use on workers if uh, if they get uh, plutonium in their bodies, and uh, and so. Um, I worked very closely with the medical people on whether they should uh, should come in and use the um, use chelation or whether it was advisable not to. Uh, uh, in some cases, it was it was right treatment, and in other cases, it uh, it was uh, just as well if we didn't uh, yeah. use it. Could you define what uh, chelating chelation okay. is? Okay. Yeah, a chelation, a chelation comes from a Latin word that means a claw or to grab onto. And so a chelating agent is one which, uh, if you put it into the bloodstream like we were doing, it would grab onto the metal ions that are in the blood. And, and so if you had plutonium floating in there or uh, tied up in the, in the chemical matrix of the blood, the chelate, excuse me, the chelating agent would would grab hold of that plutonium ion and carry it out through the kidneys and excrete the uh, excrete the plutonium. So it would was effective in tr in pulling the plutonium as it went from a wound uh, into the bloodstream, going toward the liver and the bones. It would uh, intercept the plutonium and or and americium and would take them out through the urinary pathway. And uh, so it was uh, so chelating agent is one which is very effective in, in uh, intercepting and uh, grabbing hold of those um, molecules and carrying them out through the, uh, through the excretion pathway. So you would advise uh, which kinds of wounds you would do this and which you would not? Right. The types of situation, uh, generally it was more dependent upon the chemical form of the material, whether it was an oxide or a nitrate or chloride of plutonium. Uh, as to whether it was advisable or not, and uh, if it was through inhalation or whether it was through a cut or whether it was through an acid burn, all of these determined uh, whether we would um, use chelation or not, uh, and whether we should go in and uh, try if it was a wound or acid burn, uh, what what treatment we should try to use to to uh, keep it, keep it from getting into the body. Yes. Now, getting back to the buildings, um, I remember in, in our last uh, talk, you uh, went into good detail about the lung counter. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I was kind of wondering, what happened to that? Okay. <laughs> That's a good question. It, it, um, it turns out that, that uh, the lung counter facilities, as we started tearing down those buildings, we had three big steel rooms that I had put in, in 122 building. And we had an experimental steel room that we put in uh, in 123. And when we started tearing down 123, which was one of the very first buildings we tore down at Rocky Flats, when we started tearing that down, I had attended a conference back in Washington, D.C. with seven of the scientists from Russia. And, and as we got into the discussions with the Russian scientists that had been studying the workers in at, at Mayak, uh, outside of Chelyabinsk uh, in um, the Ural Mountains, which is kind of the equivalent of Rocky Flats. Uh, it's where the plutonium production was taking place. And many of these workers had received m large, large quantities of plutonium in their bodies. In fact, uh, so much in some cases that they actually died of radiation sickness. And in talking with these Russian scientists, they said, you know, you have a lung counter for counting plutonium. We don't have anything like that in Russia. 
and they asked several of them asked if there was any way they could come visit and, and see our lung counters and get an idea of how we do, went about measuring plutonium in the lungs of the workers and and uh, these are these are great scientists but uh, but they just didn't have the equipment that uh, that we had uh, developed in the United States and and um, so when uh, when we got ready to tear down the building I contacted some of the f folks back in Washington DC and I said you know this this steel is pre-World War II steel that we used in those very special steel which is almost un uh, almost impossible to get your hands on now because it's all gone basically and it's very has very low radiation content in the steel I said you know it's a crime to take that steel and and uh, just use it as scrap iron which was what they were planning on doing just scrap ironing it. and you got 64 tons of steel in one of those rooms 64 tons Plus, um, plus lead, tin, and zinc uh, liners on the inside of that. And I said, those poor people in Russia don't have a facility like this. I said, is there any way we can make it possible to ship one of these over there so that they could count the Russian workers and we could get the information on those people, which kind of fills in a, a gap that we have. We have the, the real low levels of plutonium that our workers had experienced here and we had very high levels of in animal studies that we've done but MIAC those workers kind of fit between those and I said I said that the information would be invaluable and I said uh, you know why uh, is there any way we can work it out well between all of us we managed to work out the details and we shipped one of those big uh, lung counters with steel rooms had it refurbished by a fellow down in uh, in Oklahoma and then shipped it over on a ship and then by train up to the Ural Mountains and then they had to put it on a truck during uh, during frost time because the roads are dirt roads and the, the truck would sink in the mud if otherwise so they had to take it up in the winter time and take it by truck then from the trail uh, the train uh, rail up to the up to the facility at Mayak up in the mountains, and uh, they are now counting those workers, and they have published some papers on the results of that. So one of those steel rooms went to Russia and is being used to this very day on workers over. And in, you know it's being used. Yes, then. yes. Uh, in fact, um, some of my friends have been over there. Uh, I didn't manage to get over there myself, but some of my friends helped them uh, learn how to run the equipment and set up the equipment for them, and. Uh, David Hicks, uh, who used to work at Rocky Flats and is now out at Livermore, um, was instrumental in putting all of the uh, all of the equipment together for him. And uh, then the other steel rooms, the the three other steel rooms have been shipped up to Idaho Falls, Idaho, for the uh, DOE uh, laboratory um, uh, accreditation program. They're going to use at least a couple of those to uh, for calibration for calibrating lung counters throughout the United States for the Department of Energy and and they're going to save at least one of those steel rooms is going to be kind of saved back for use at any other facility if they recreate a new rocky flat someplace or something like this then we've got still have that steel on hand that we can use it to uh, to reestablish another lung counter facility the equipment that was inside of that, uh, those lung counters, uh, most of that, uh, some of that equipment anyway, and a great share of it, has been given to Colorado State University to help them. They are, they have been given a grant by Homeland Security to try to set up a facility to where, kind of in the central part of the United States, where if if a radioactive device was to um, to be uh, detonated or, or set off a contamination spread uh, they could have a facility where they could count people for radioactivity up there at Colorado State and so a lot of that equipment is up there now uh, being being uh, set up at Colorado State University and also for t training and teaching purposes for the students so that's kind of yeah, kind of the history of what's happened with those lung counters because yeah. Those two buildings are completely gone. The ground is all flattened out, and uh, they've planted grass over those areas. And so, 
there's no buildings there anymore, and, uh, and but uh, that, that is uh, what's happened to those lung counters that I talked about last time. Very interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other um, thoughts about buildings or, you know, about the buildings uh, with respect to the cleanup? Yeah, well, uh, let me just say that, uh, you know, the cleanup has really been extensive. and. Um, when you get into get into the cleanup of uh, the facilities there at Rocky Flats, so you get into various and sundry problems and issues that had to be dealt with, and it wasn't just the radioactivity. You had the beryllium contamination. You had chemical contamination uh, from a lot of the chemicals that were very toxic that had uh, that had to be used in the chemistry processes, and uh, and um, so those buildings had to be treated very carefully and handled very carefully. The workers had to be protected and, uh, and uh, most of my work since the last interview has really been oversight of, of the health and safety, um, uh, making sure that the workers are protected from the chemicals that they might come in contact with as that's in the concrete and in the, in the pores of the uh, building materials and the equipment and so forth. Because they, they have to go in, they had to go in and take the equipment apart and take the glove boxes apart, dismantle them and, uh, and put those into waste containers to ship off. And so these folks were right in there disturbing things. Uh, there was a lot of uh, shaking and rattling and disturbance of the areas and, uh, and as a result it, re it, it had the tendency to release a lot of that contamination as they were taking bolts loose. and. Uh, and got into the nooks and crev crevices and cr uh, uh, so forth that uh, they were exposing. And so, so, so did protecting them mean having them wear a particular kind of gear mainly? Wearing special gear to make sure that they, uh, their breathing was protected, setting up engineering controls. In other words, uh, uh, coming up with ways in which if you were trying to take something apart, setting up a vacuum system here to try to suck all that in, in and, uh, and keep it from getting loose into the area and creating a, an, a, a big atmosphere of contamination. Trying to contain it as much as possible. We used a lot of fixative materials where we would uh, spray, spray a kind of a sticky substance on and it would keep, the, keep that uh, contamination uh, controlled against uh, any of the removable contamination, keep it from floating off. And uh, so we were using all different kinds of techniques on ventilation ducts we would, and piping and so forth. A lot of times we would drill small holes in there and, and spray, um, uh, spray foam material in there that would foam up and then uh, uh, harden and it would encapsulate the material, the contamination. And so just various techniques that we came up with, engineering techniques to protect the workers. And, and with, uh, with beryllium, you know, we're talking about uh, making sure that the, the levels of contamination that, uh, that they are breathing is, is well below the standards. And uh, mm -hmm. we establish standards. Uh, beryllium is, uh, is one that's really become a big, big issue in the last 10 years. And, uh, and I believe you said before that beryllium was in many of the buildings. Many of the buildings. Uh, we know at least 39, anywhere from 39 to 43 of the buildings uh, had, uh, had beryllium uh, at one time or another had small quantity, at least small quantities. And when you got into uh, several of the buildings like 865 and 444, these were production buildings where we did machining of beryllium and foundry work with beryllium. And, and so there was a, a very high concentration of beryllium on the equipment that was in those buildings uh, in the, and in the ventilation systems um, and throughout the buildings. They were very, very contaminated. And so, so we really had to, had to uh, put a great deal of effort into coming up with ways where we could dismantle these buildings, tear them down, take the, take the buildings down then, get, the, get them down low enough so that the concrete and so forth wasn't a hazard to the public. And because a lot of these were taken to landfills and uh, a lot of these, this material from these buildings was taken to landfills. And, uh, and so it had to be brought down to a level which was, uh, we felt was safe and, and uh, 
and uh, I've, I've been involved uh, as chairman of one of the national committees on, on, on uh, what are those levels of contamination for beryllium that are acceptable and uh, how do you get down to that level and how do you sample to make sure you're measuring appropriately. And this would be uh, through uh, on this kind of um, oversight is through the federal government only or does it it's pertain through, to industry? It's through the federal government but because the federal government because Rocky Flats really is a, is, is a, practically a world leader in this area on beryllium and, and uh, it is in, on a lot of the, radi uh, the plutonium radiation. Um, it, it is, so it's through DOE, but we are setting the precedent. We have set the precedent. We've set the bar throughout the Department of Energy plus throughout the nation. And now even ca Canada, Australia, Israel, Germany, France, India, um, all these other countries. And uh, I just was uh, privileged to be at the International Beryllium Conference in Montreal. I was asked to be one of the keynote speakers and deliver a couple of addre addresses there at the, at the conference. And uh, they asked me to speak on how to go about D&D. &D. And, and at that, uh, um, these other countries, Canada has, uh, has really taken, taken the issue with beryllium. Uh, uh, they, they've identified the industries, 20, about 2,500 industries that they know where beryllium is associated because beryllium is now, has really become a big issue. It, we know it causes health problems in some, uh, certain individuals. Uh, about 4.5% of the population seems to be hypersensitive to it. Uh, d there is a, a genetic predis predisposition that appears to uh, occur. and. The, and these individuals, um, uh, these countries, uh, we, found, we found out that those people that are susceptible to it, it doesn't take very much in many cases. It takes very low levels of microgram quantities, uh, fractions of a microgram per hundred square centimeters or per cubic meter of air. And that, that was true of some of the workers at Rocky Flats, wasn't it, that didn't even have much exposure? Right, yes. Even so, a couple of secretaries that, that never even went into the areas but were handling some of the paperwork that uh, had beryllium contamination uh, from being, ba being in those areas. Uh, some of those people have come down with uh, health problems. And so this has really become a health issue. And it turns out that we now have found out that all the aluminum in the United States are, are throughout the world, practically. Uh, all the aluminum has small trace amounts of beryllium added to it. So now the auto industry, the airline industries, uh, all these industries that use aluminum and copper, which is used in electronic gear, it has 2% beryllium alloy uh, added to it. And uh, so these, and this is added to it to, for metallurgical purposes. And so if a, if a person is machining them or creating dusts where where it uh, is of respirable particle sizes, why then you have uh, uh, potential problems for individuals, and so it's so Rocky Flats has been on the leading edge. We uh, we have set the bar for the, and so now OSHA is following a lot of the example, and they've asked us to help. They are looking at at. Um, redoing their standards based on what we have been using and how we've handled, uh, handled it. We, we handle beryllium at Rocky Flats. We, we established a program which is really pretty much the same as what we do for, for uh, radioactivity, uh, setting, setting step-off pads and, and, uh, for the workers. You know, they come up here, they get monitored here, and then before they can leave the area, they take off their clothing and uh, take off their outer clothing and so forth. And uh, and we we handle it almost the same same way as we would um, would the uh, radioactive materials. So it's so it's a it's a big issue. It's a, beryllium has become a, a major issue. You know, you just don't want to, want to take a truck. And load up a bunch of building material, uh, old rubble, uh, concrete rubble, or something like this, and put it out on a highway, running down a highway to a to a landfill, without knowing that they that the public is protected, that everybody 
that's handling it is protected and, uh, and that it uh, isn't escaping into the environment and contaminating the environment. So, so there's a lot to be, uh, yes. lot to be uh, ha uh, said. To. Were you involved at all in the, uh, the federal compensation that went through Congress? <laughs> Very much so. In fact, okay. I was involved with, uh, with uh, Dr. David Michaels, uh, who established that program, and I, I've been involved with it from the very inception, I, and uh, still am involved with it very, de very deeply. And in fact, uh, um, I was just contacted about two weeks ago, asked if I would be willing to, now that I'm retiring and leaving here, today's my last day, at Rocky Flats and, and with the Department of Energy, they've asked me if I would be willing to be a consultant for the EEOICPA, that Energy Employees Compensation Program, it, uh, uh, for the uh, Oversight Advisory Committee, the National uh, Radiation Advisory Committee Oversight, and if I would be willing to serve as consultant for the, uh, with them for reviewing uh, the special exposure cohorts and site profiles and uh, oversight over the dose reconstruction project that's going on under NIOSH. And so, yeah, I, and. Uh, and I've been in, I was involved with um, with the legislation that's just come up uh, through um, um, Congressman Udall's and and um, and uh, Senator Allard and uh, and um, um, Congressman Bo Prey and and um, and um, Salazar uh, the legislation to make a special exposure cohort of the Rocky Flats population. Petition that was put forward by the uh, by the Steelworkers Union here, and and then the congressional uh, group that uh, from Colorado that has put forth legislation to make a special exposure cohort for Rocky Flats. Uh -huh. I I was very much involved in in all of that. Yes. Now, would that be for beryllium specifically, or other? It's for it's for everything. Uh -huh. It's a, a, but especially for radioactive uh, radioactivity under uh, because subpart that wasn't B. wasn't covered under the other. Under su yeah. subpart B for radioactivity, um, where where individuals they are doing dose reconstruction for those individuals, um, going back and to see whether they had enough radioactivity in their bodies or were exposed to enough radiation. Uh, from an external source, um, whether they received high enough dosages that it would, that it may have been, been a, uh, a high enough level of probability of causation to cause cancers. The various uh, cancers there are 22 or 24 cancers that are covered covered under that section, and then under said part E, which is a new one that uh, Congress just uh, just passed here recently. Is, uh, is for chemical exposure. So it uh, includes any chemicals, carbon tetrachloride, trichloroethylene, or all, any of the other chemicals uh, that might cause health problems, not necessarily cancer, but other health problems. And, and so beryllium is also included in, uh, in, in the legislation, but it, it covers radiation, beryllium, and then specifically um, uh, other chemicals. And, and so I've had a big part in all of that, um, played quite a role in it, and, and then uh, um, the dose reconstruction, which is going on right now, um, um, I play another part in, in that uh, back in the 1990s, uh, Roger Falk, who I worked with, uh, went to graduate school with, Roger and I recognized the fact that, uh, that uh, the neutron doses that workers were receiving back in the early days was not monitored appropriate or, or correctly. And we found, when we did a pilot study in the early 90s, found that some of those workers had been, they were told that their dosimeters read zeros. And when we went back and found the films in the archives, 90,000 films, little films, 90,000 of those stored away in the federal center down here, went back and reread those, found that those workers had actually received, in some cases, pretty high doses of neutron dose. And even before that, before they even had been measured uh, in the early days, in the early and uh, mid-1950s, they didn't even do dose, neutron dosimetry. And so there's no measurements on people there. 
And then when they did start measuring it, they ha they chose the wrong people in some cases, and and they didn't put films on the, all the people they should have. And so there's a lot of there was a lot of missing data. So we established a neutron dose reconstruction project, which has, was carried out here at Rocky Flats, and and um, then. Um, the people that were working that we brought together to work on that project uh, were uh, transferred off-site since we were closing the site here to a, to a facility here in the Denver area where they continued that project and actually went back and reread all of those 90,000 films plus they uh, where data was missing they went in and uh, by looking at the gamma doses and various other factors came up with uh, with the the what we feel is pretty accurate uh, dosimetry f to how much dose should be added to those people now that information is being transferred over to NIOSH so that the workers from Rocky Flats will get credited with additional dose uh, many of people will have additional dose even beyond what their record showed originally and will that be accessible to individual workers? Yes, we're, can? in fact, we are notifying them just right now. In fact, we just got the approval today from Washington to go ahead and send out letters of notification to each of the workers that were involved, 5,317 workers that were involved in that project, notifying them that uh, most of those people will have additional exposure added to their records. And then we will, and we will send them what, how much is being added to each of their records, and then that information is going to be put in each and every one of their uh, radiation exposure record files. Their files are going to be pulled back from the federal center down here in Lakewood, and each one of those files will have this additional information added to the file as an addendum to the file. So. So and that will be available to the individuals for them to take to their doctors. Absolutely, doctor. yes. They, they, we are sending copies to all those people that we can uh, that we can find. Uh, we're, we're trying to track down every single one of those that we possibly can, or their next of kin. We're trying to track down next of kin on those that are deceased. So and so that will all be made available to them, and they will be sending that to them. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yes. Now I had heard some criticism with respect to the compensation for beryllium, that the, the monies didn't get to the, the people very quickly. Is that a bureaucratic problem or? Um, well, there, there were some problems in the early going. Um, the Department of Labor was not real familiar. Beryllium was a brand new thing which just, you know, they were very few it. doctors, very few doctors even know what you're talking about when you call, uh, talk about chronic beryllium disease. There are only a few doctors in the country or in the world that know what it is. There are more and more learning now. And the Department of Labor was given the, uh, given the responsibility to handle that program and they themselves didn't know anything about beryllium. I had to go and sit down with a lot of the people from the Department of Labor and, and, and try to educate those people and uh, they were making, and like any new program that comes on, there it's, it's, the errors are made from time to time and, and so it took a little, it, the, it was a, there was a learning curve associated with that and so it did take time and uh, and to get geared up to be able to handle those cases uh, in an, uh, an expedient way uh, did take some time, and, and there was uh, was delay on the part of some of that of some of that information, you know, the payments of some of those claims. Some of the claims on the radiation side are still held up today, and that's being held up because the Department of uh, the Department of Labor and and NIOSH has been holding the Rocky Flats war, uh, cases until they got this neutron dose reconstruction information that they could add to it because a person might not qualify uh, with the information they have in their official record but now when they get this additional information now they do qualify and so they've been holding up a lot of claims, uh, several hundreds of claims they've been holding up from Rocky Flats waiting for this information to, uh, to get over to them. And that information should be transferred maybe yet this week to NIOSH so that they can go ahead and, and work those claims through now. 
that must be satisfying to you to be kind of working at this end of it uh, is it's it's it's, yeah. it's very satisfying because again it's trying to help the workers do and that's that's what my life is dedicated to Um, let's see, one of the things that I was hoping we could go back and talk a little bit uh -huh. about, uh, that we talk, just, just touched on a little bit last time, was um, you mentioned that you at one time had debates with Dr. Carl Johnson uh -huh. and that you were doing some epidemiological studies, that, and we didn't really get into that. <laughs> yeah, back in the, back in the, uh, the days of the, the, the activist period, uh, especially in the 70s and early 80s, in that time frame, there was a there was a lot of activity. A lot of people. Um, uh, let me try to word this appropriately. There was a there were a lot of people that radiation was a real scare to them, and a lot of people who were misinformed, misled, uh, didn't have information and sometimes we scientists have a hard time communicating with with the lay people and so it's not all their fault sometimes it's our fault as well and in the in the 1970s when this activity really was at a peak um, I was asked um, because I had gone out and done a lot of public speaking and speaking for civic clubs and uh, schools and various groups. I was asked by the plant to go down and sit down with some of the leaders of the activist groups. Mm -hmm. And we had um, the Colorado Department of Health uh, as a moderator of that and we were kind of meeting uh, secretively. It, it was not public uh, public knowledge and we were doing it so that we could try to sit down in a, in a civil manner and speak uh, speak across the table and they said Beisline would you be willing to go down and sit down and try to communicate because it's a real paradigm there's a real paradigm between these two groups you know here's here's the scientific community here's here's the activist community and each one's talking past the other. Neither one is really communicating, and, uh, and we we all have our our biases and so forth. And and so I I agreed to that, and I went down representing the plant to some meetings down in the Cherry Creek area, and I'd sit in the, I'd sit down there, and uh, uh, Dr. Ellen Mangioni from the state health department and I, uh, I was moderating this uh, these sessions and. And I'd sit on one side of the table, and I'd have a half a dozen activists on the other side, and uh, and Ellen uh, kind of keeping the keeping the the, the uh, meeting uh, under control. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, and we'd meet about once a month, and so it was part of the time it was once every two weeks, and this went on for a couple of years. And I'd go down, and we'd uh, I'd go down with a whole armload of materials because I felt, you know, I, 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 they felt like I could communicate with these folks. If anybody could, I, I could probably do as much as anyone to try to communicate. And I had the scientific background, the information, uh, and I'd walk down with a great big armload of materials under my arm so that anything I told them. I could back up with scientific evidence, and so I'd go down and and discuss with these folks, and we'd get into some very heated discussions at times. But uh, you know, we'd try to keep it civil and try to keep uh, uh, try to communicate and try to see their side of it as well. And now, was it usually the same group of people? It was so usually that, pretty much yeah. the same group. So, so you could form. It was a nucleus. It we got a relationship and. And as time went by, it became a very, very good relationship, very friendly relationship. Mm -hmm. To this day, a lot of those folks are good friends of mine. And uh, um, so I, I spent 
many, many hours uh, in these sessions with these folks. And uh, Carl Johnson was asked to come in and speak a couple of times. And, and he and I had some discussions with the activists uh, who looked to him as uh, pretty much the, their, their guiding light. And, and I came in with materials that refuted a lot of what he had done. Uh, uh, he, he really did some gerrymandering of data and, and uh, so on. And, uh, and so we got into some pretty, uh, pretty interesting uh, conversations. And I'd pull out the, my materials and show where the, where the error was in his methodologies and so on. And, and it really was an eye opener to them uh, to, to see you know, where, where, he, where he had convinced them of things that were not appropriate and were not right at all, uh, but, but they didn't have enough scientific knowledge to be able to re realize that, they, they, that he was pulling the wool over their eyes many times in some of these areas. And so it, it turns out that, that when it was all over with, uh, that this, this led up to what became the uh, Rocky Flats, uh, Colorado Department of Health Rocky Flats study which uh, the governor selected a, a committee of people to serve uh, from around the United States, uh, experts and so on. I was asked to not be ex directly a part of that because of my association with this plant and with the Department of Energy and so on. But uh, even though I was working on the contractor side, at that time, um, I, they, they asked me to be a consultant to them and to attend all the meetings and be there to help uh, answer questions that came up about Rocky Flats and, and the epidemiological studies that I had been carrying out with. Um, because in the late 70s, we, we started, uh, started doing epidemiological studies with, uh, with uh, Los Alamos. Uh, and um, we were looking at uh, cancer rates of the p worker population at Rocky Flats. We were looking at brain cancers and so on. And um, and and I was co-author on some of these uh, some of these papers. And so uh, I I acted as a as a consultant to the to the group, but uh, but was not uh, would not, not considered a, part a, of not that. a member of the actual group itself. And, and of course, that study just ended up here a couple of years ago. Yeah. How did you feel about their work overall? I, I felt like they were quite thorough, and I thought it was, uh, for the most part, very, very good. I, I, th I thought they did a very thorough job. They, even to this day, we even here at Rocky Flats, we even use a lot of the, the information that they put together. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was uh, it was it was well done. It was uh, very thorough. Um, and um, and I, I, they went back and did stuff that uh, we could never have done um, ourselves. I don't think um, uh, here uh, here at the site because uh, it required real in-depth study of uh, you know going into records, di digging through the records in the archives, and digging out the inventories of you know how much chemi how many chemicals or did we actually have on site? How much of those chemicals were used on site? And uh, approximating or estimating how much uh, um, how much was used and how much might have gotten uh, uh, yeah. uh, put into the environment and so on. Uh, and these are you know these are very technical questions that required uh, technical expertise from around the United States to to answer a lot of these questions. Mm -hmm. Now, as I understand it, that had to do not with workers at all. It was with people uh, health. Through the for the whole community. Right. It was right? it was community based. It was um, outside Rocky Flats. Right. So what what effect? What the, how much how much exposure, chemical exposure, radioactive exposure, etc., was went outside the borders of of Rocky Flats? How much went out, and how much? Uh, what 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 was the risk? Mm -hmm. What were the risk factors to the to the population outside the plant? Yes. As you look back on that now, it, it sounds like you. Do you feel that this wouldn't really have come about if you'd not had that period of time, uh, activists to, you know, talk with you and others about? Does, does it seem as though that 
uh, I think set the stage for this? I think it set the stage. I, I, I don't want to take credit for, for starting that, but, but I think that it really helped to set the stage for, for to, to move on to, uh, to being able to now sit down and bring some of those people into a, into a structured uh, um, study. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it also brought, brought this health issue to the forefront for the funding that was necessary because it was very expensive. It, uh, you know, you're talking about several million dollars a year that it was costing the taxpayers to, to, uh, to do these studies. And, and so it, but I think it, it helped to set the stage for, for, for this, this to take place. But I don't want to take the credit for making it happen. It, uh, I think, it, but it, it did open the door. It put the, put the crack in the door for, the, for it to start, uh, that to start taking place. I would think, though, that you being a person that was working with uh, worker health as opposed to someone who was in charge of production, that mm -hmm. that made a crucial difference in terms of, you know, you... Well, I hope so, Dorothy. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I hope, I hope it did. Uh, I, I felt like I had good rapport with the workers and do even to this day. I still, still have a close, close rapport and a close uh, friendship with, uh, with a lot of the production workers. And, uh, and, and you know, I've worked closely with the union, with the, with the uh, work, uh, steel workers union who represented the worker for, force. And I've had, a, I've had a good close relationship with, uh, with those folks. Uh, and hopefully uh, have, um, have been able to, um, to bridge that uh, gap that j oft times exists between, between management and, and the workers and, and um, people in the scientific group and the workers. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I, I, I hope so. I hope I've been able to do, do some yeah. beneficial work that way. Now you, you were mentioning that you had a close relationship with the union and in the cleanup has that been that's an been, issue that has been just absolutely overpowering uh, oh. that that has because working together with them and doing cleanup like when we get into beryllium issues or radio radiation issues the workers themselves uh, they know they can come to me if they if they had a question they could come to me and say you know this isn't right, and and they they felt at freedom to come to me. At the same time, we could sit down at lessons learned meetings or at uh, at um, at the um, um, at the at the meetings if if an incident occurred where we where we said oh you know stop work it's uh, there. We've exceeded the limits uh, for um, for exposure, even though the people had on ra uh, protective gear and so on. We'd stop the work and say, "Okay, let's stop and take a look at this and see what what we need to do to correct things, make things so that we don't even don't even take the risk of, of this." And and the workers themselves, many times, many many times, the workers themselves came up with the best ideas as to how they could. Do, better do things and more effectively do things in a safe manner and and make it a safer operation and at the same time not slow down the process or not slow down the work but 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 making it making it safer and they came up with the ideas in many many of these cases and they recognized where they made the mistake you know that here's where I made a mistake and and the material got loose by the way we way we put it into the bins or something and they made a puff or something um, they they would come up with the uh, with the um, with the concerns and then come up with the, with the answers to those concerns and how, how to how to best um, best um, uh, proceed forward and this, so it's been extremely beneficial to work closely with those workers and and uh, give them the credit that they have coming due for recognizing it and not, not to take those people to task. Okay, you know, slap them upside the head or say, you know, you screwed up, you're fired. But to stop and say, okay, where do you think we can improve the situation? And uh, 
I, th I think it's been extremely beneficial mm -hmm. throughout the, the cleanup operation in D&D. I, I don't think we'd have made the progress that we have uh, would, uh, without that. Now, uh, I, it, it, from, from my limited understanding, uh, many of the workers in the cleanup have not been, they've been um, uh, contract, mm -hmm. not yes. Rocky Flat employees. Has that been presented any particular problems in it, or, or does it have some advantages? Or well, it's, it's a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. It is a disadvantage. Um, but it's, it's an advantage from the standpoint that it's given us extra additional manpower that we didn't have. Um, because a lot of people had left, found other jobs, they knew it was coming to an end, uh, they're, they're, they're working themselves out of a job. So they had to bring in outside labor. And it, and it was a disadvantage to, from the standpoint that these folks never had ever worked in these kinds of conditions. A lot of these workers came in, they didn't know what a respirator was. They didn't know what protective gear was. They came in with, without the safety mentality that we required here. And um, they had come out of an environment where they, uh, many of these out of the, and, and the, the uh, just the labor environment, where practices out there were totally different than what we, uh, we accepted here. You know, you just don't do it that way. That's, that, that's a dangerous way of doing it, but they'd been gotten by with it for years outside here. But in our case, with our oversight, with uh, sitting in a fishbowl and working with the uh, high risk materials, the uh, highly toxic materials that we had to work with here, you just don't take chances like that. And so it was a, it was a disadvantage to, have to hire a lot of these people because they had no experience. They didn't know what it was like to work in a, re uh, in a uh, respirator or even a hood uh, that, you know, they blocks their vision partially and, and breathing uh, supplied air and so forth. Uh, this was a whole new world to some of these people. And, uh, now, were they all union members? Or no, these, uh, well, they, uh, these were, they came, yeah, I guess they were, uh, I think most of them were, uh, were, were required to be a, a, be a part of a union, uh, but, uh, but they were for all the various different trades. Oh. Uh, they, they weren't from any one single union. The, four, uh, the one thing we did have was that a lot of the workers that had worked here previously did carry on across, and we could mix those people in, and, uh, and they could kind of be the leaders within those groups of people and, uh, and help them learn, the, the, learn how to go about doing their things appropriately. And so it, uh, the steel workers really did help out in, in uh, helping to uh, helping to train and, uh, and work side by side with these guys uh, that were coming in from the outside that uh, didn't have that kind of an ex experience background. Is there any one or two incidents that stand out in your mind as particularly difficult or surprising or <laughs> Well, I think I think one uh, one that I might mention is is the one which um, really surprised all of us. It was when we were taking down 771 building, which is a, was one of the big production chemistry buildings. And we, were, we thought everything was going along great. And then all of a sudden, we started seeing little trace quantities, just very trace, minuscule quantities, a few atoms coming through in the bioassays of these individuals, so the urinary excretions and so on. And we couldn't figure out where it was coming from, why these folks were coming up with this. And, and we thought we had it narrowed down to a couple of specific incidences that had occurred that where the, where the practices weren't real clean and we needed to make some changes. And then lo and behold, we came up with the fact that there were some ways in which they were handling the waste 
putting it into crates and so forth that was probably creating an environment that the people that didn't have respiratory protection it was creating an environment next to those some folks and causing a, was causing some problem and uh, and um, we thought we had had everything controlled and, and it wasn't as controlled as we thought it was and and it was but it was at such a low level that it wasn't being picked up we we weren't picking it up on a routine monitoring program and uh, and it wasn't until we uh, we had a couple of small incidences that we started picking up picking up some of these other cases out here that that just were outliers it just didn't make sense to us and 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 so that that was one which really was kind of a shock and a surprise to us but mm -hmm. But you know, it, when you look at what we've done over the past 10 years here at Rocky Flats, the progress in tearing down buildings and the enormous amount of radioactive contamination and chemical contamination that was involved in, in, in doing this, and you look at the number of buildings in the, in the, in the entire site, you know, over 800 structures that have been taken down. and. Uh, and many of these large, large structures with with hundreds of glove boxes and tanks, uh, big tanks of chemicals and and uh, radioactivity, um, and the small amount of of um, health risk that's that's or health uh, health impact that it's had. I mean, we have not had any deaths as a result of any of the activity. We've not had serious injuries uh, to speak of. It's just a, you know, it's it's really a, uh, a credit to those uh, to the workforce here. Mm -hmm. Has it been a big worry to you to kind of have the responsibility for the health oversight? Well, it's uh, it's. It's always a worry, uh, you know, when you take on a big, big project like this, and uh, and you know the know the levels of contamination that uh, that we're working with, and uh, trying to find a mi uh, the right mix, you know, uh, if you if you go down and try to decontaminate down to the, to so that everything is completely clean. You're putting the worker at more and more risk because it's down to those high, very low levels, and there's a trade-off someplace where you say, "Okay, <clears throat> clean it up to this level. Now we'll go ahead and cut this up, or we'll take it, dismantle it, and just take it and put it into a crate. We're not going to take all of it out, and we're just going to go ahead and send it out as contaminated waste, rather than trying to decon it all the way down to zero because that puts more people at more risk. It takes more people to do those when you get down to a certain level, and then it takes a lot of extra work to get down from here down to here. It, uh, and and um, and you're putting at people at at more and more risk. And so, so there's a, a fine line that you have to walk uh, with this. Yeah. Now, in terms of um, the contaminated waste that's <coughs> that's. Uh, been taken off site. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some people wonder, well, you know, we've gotten rid of it here, but where is it going? <laughs> <laughs> there are several different locations. Um, the 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 plutonium that could be um, the plutonium itself, the the, the material, the um, material that could continue to be used was shipped to a couple of different locations here in the United States DOE facilities. The plutonium waste or residues and so forth that weren't, uh, that couldn't be, couldn't, uh, couldn't economically be, be salvaged were, were shipped down to the WIP facility, waste isolation pilot plant down in, in, um, in the salt mines down in southern New Mexico. And uh, those, all of that material is now, we've made our last shipment of that material. The, what we call lower, low level waste though, and mixed wastes, those low level wastes, part of it goes, has gone to the Nevada test site and Excuse me yes. just a minute. Uh, I need to change the tape. All right. Okay. Go right Can you ahead. hold that thought? Mm -hmm.
history uh, with Dr. Bob Beislein. So can you pick up okay, where you yes. were? The, the other waste facilities that we have been using for shipping uh, low, what we call low-level waste then, there are two, two basic facilities. One is, um, is out at the Nevada test site where uh, they are burying some of this waste in one of the big craters that was created by the nuclear testing back in the 50s and 60s. And they're burying it down in the bottom of one of these big craters. Some of the rest of the waste is being shipped to EnviroCare, which is a company in a facility in um, in uh, Utah, where low-level waste has been uh, set. Uh, an area has been set aside for low-level waste uh, uh, repository, and and so these are this is where the low-level mixed waste uh, are are being sent. So, uh, yeah, there are specific locations around the country. The old, back in the old days, we used to ship a lot of our waste up to Idaho, but Idaho is now closed, and in fact, they're now digging up, and they, I get calls quite frequently from Idaho saying, you know, this is what we're finding in this pit that we're digging up, and, uh, and uh, can you tell us more about it? <laughs> And uh, so I've been uh, provide, providing some information to those folks in terms of, you know, they have uh, some of the radioactive materials from the 1969 fire, the cleanup of that big fire up there, and some of the some of the materials are mixed uh, plutonium and beryllium waste and so on, and they don't know for sure how to hand, go about handling uh, handling a situation where they've got radioactive and non-radioactive wastes uh, that are mixed together and so forth and so so I get periodic questions uh, from from some of these but uh, that so all of that stuff that was shipped up to Idaho now is being dug back up out of the ground and uh, out of the pits there and and being processed and and uh, much the same as what we're doing here at Rocky Flats now uh -huh. yeah. and the places that the waste has gone do you feel pretty comfortable that these are our long-term Solutions? The ones, the ones that are are being uh, shipped to now, yes, I, I feel pretty comfortable with those. Uh, I think that I think they're good, uh, good facilities. The WIP facility is, uh, I think, is uh, the best we can possibly come up with, uh, and uh, and the uh, <clears throat> now I think the, the the facilities in Utah and Nevada are, are just uh, are excellent uh, facilities there. They're out of the area from which uh, there's possibility of uh, groundwater or anything like this uh, uh, causing problems of the leaching of the of the waste uh, into areas and and so it's a uh, for the population I think the safety of the population is well in hand. Yeah. Yes. Let's see. Uh, <clears throat> You know, in um, you were talking in the last oral history about some, I think, early studies with uh, plutonium exposure, and you mentioned Wright Langham, and yes. uh, mentioned that the injection of plutonium had been a controversial issue. Oh yes. <laughs> uh, would you would you mind kind of talking more about that that whole issue well, and how it affected you in your work? Well, it's. Um, the the issue uh, was one, and one has to kind of put themselves. Uh, you know, we what was done then was done then, and and it's it, we wouldn't be able to do it today. We wouldn't do it today. It uh, it it was a but at the time it was felt to be right and and done uh, done appropriately and and it was um, and and for the most part it was uh, uh, right langham was uh, was we had almost no knowledge of plutonium how it worked in the body uh, how it was excreted how it went, where it went within the body and uh, and so on and and we had no way of measuring in the body the amount of plutonium that people had uh, from accidents, and he had some, he had some cases of, during World War II, the making of the first atomic bombs. He had individuals that had been involved in accidents, 
where they had taken plutonium into their bodies through inhalation and, and cuts and so forth. And he knew it had gone and gotten into their bodies, but he didn't know how to measure, quantify the amount that they had. And so he did this experiment to try to quantify, saying, okay, if I inject, and these were this particular group of people, and it's well publicized now publicly, <clears throat> that it was a small group of people that had, um, that were only expected to live for six, six months to 12 months or so. Uh, they had various serious illnesses and, and had long, a short life ahead of them. And they told them that they were going to be injected, uh, you know, asked them if they would be willing to participate, and they got uh, voluntary consent from all of these individuals and injected very small quantities of plutonium into those individuals and then, and then monitored their urinary excretion with time. And it's the basis upon which we do all of our bioassay to this very day. It was, it's, uh, he, he only monitored them for a short period of time, for about a year. So he had data that only came out to about a year, and then he extrapolated out and tried to extrapolate along a curve of how, what he thought this was going to be. And there were about 17 or 18 people that were injected with plutonium at the time. And, and that data, the number of atoms of plutonium excretion per 24 hours, each 24 hours, if you go back and you know here is when the incident occurred and you come out here and this is a year and a half later, you can go up on the curve and you can pretty well estimate what the amount is that the person ha had in them by, by where they're, uh, what, uh, what the level is. And, uh, and the shape of the curve, you know, is the curve down here or is it up here uh, based on the, uh, you know, the amount that they may have uh, taken into their body. And, uh, and so this, this uh, Wright Langham did this experiment and, uh, and, and it's, it's still to this day referred to as the Wright Langham equation for, bio, uh, for urinary excretion. And, uh, uh, it's been refined. Uh, many of us have refined it. Uh, we've, um, you know, we found that there were some errors in the estimation out here where he extrapolated. Then uh, there's some errors, and it's a little more complex uh, curve than what he uh, first initially uh, uh, came up with. But, but it's still the basis upon which we use to this very day to estimate how much plutonium is in the body of an individual that's involved in an accident to this day. Now, I've heard uh, workers and others talk about, use the expression, body burden. Okay. Uh, could you explain exactly what that means scientifically? Well, it's, uh, let me try to explain it uh, to the best of my ability um, uh, in, in lay terms. It's, it's, body burden was an old term that uh, was used back up until the late 1980s, about 1989 we referred to as body burdens and lung burdens and this was this was what we said was what we thought was a safe level that a person could have 40 nanocuries of plutonium in the in the bones of an individual that if they didn't have over 40 nanocuries we felt like they were that there weren't going to be and there wasn't much chance or any chance of of, um, of health effects occurring uh, cancer occurring or something um, and 16 nanocuries in the lungs, and uh, this was a lung burden. And, and so it was a quantity that we thought was, uh, had a safety factor built in. We said, okay, based on rats and mice and, and dog studies and, and uh, primate studies and so forth, this is a safe level. And uh, then we said, uh, th we didn't see any more cancers in these animals at this level. So we're going to come down to here. And we set a level down here. And we say, OK, this is what we're going to call as a body burden level. And we're not going to exceed that. Uh, we don't want to exceed that level. And so we try to keep everybody under that level. And so it's based on the, uh, it's based on mainly on animal studies, various animal studies, and extrapolating that to human beings and saying, okay, this, this is where we saw, no longer saw cancers occurring in this dog population that had been injected with plutonium. 
and so we'll set a, st set a level down here about one-tenth of that and, and so this is our sa uh, what we call body burden or safe level. And so it's based on animal, basically on animal studies. Does that help? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, some of the workers have used the expression as though a body burden is, well, is not a good thing to have. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. and, and it, but and it is. But there's it's, a degree, there's different degrees. There are different degrees. It, uh, it's, but it's, it's what we, uh, you know, the body burden, it, it's a, a lot of workers have difficulty understanding it as well. And uh, a lot of times they'll say, well, I can work up to this level, but everything's going to break loose if I go over this level. And, and that isn't the case. It's a, it's a number which just are, uh, kind of arbitrarily but scientifically has been arrived at. And we say, you know, we just don't want people to go over that level. But just, just because you're at 50, I mean 41, doesn't mean that uh, now all of a sudden you're going to get cancer. But it, but there, it, it's a risk factor, and it's uh, you know it's probability. Uh, it gets into probability of uh, causation, and and actually we, when you get right down to it, when you uh, in all the studies I've done on the workers, the autopsies that I've taken, and, and been involved with, and and the um, studies that um, uh, the epidemiological studies looking at the cancer rates at two Rocky Flats, doing the follow-up studies of the workers, which I started back in 1980, and I think I went pretty fairly thoroughly, went through that last time, um, that now adding on the additional years since the last time I spoke with you, um, the additional years, um, we just are not seeing health, uh, you know, I think that level that we established then, and now we use a, a CED, a CEDE, uh, um, uh, another terminology. CEDE uh, meaning? Well, it's 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 a um, it's a term for um, uh, for the amount of uh, dose that an individual uh, amount a lifetime dose that an individual will get, and it's it's it can be correlated back to the body burden in a way, but it's, it's really set up on a, on a, a lifetime dosage, uh, what a lifetime dose will be, uh, equivalent dose. And looking at, these, looking at this, um, I think our, our values that were established even back in those early days were pretty good because we're not seeing a real health effects. Uh, we can uh, we cannot uh, really tie link an increased cancer incidence. We're not seeing an increased cancer incidence in our population, although it's it's somewhat small for uh, for an epidemi a good epidemiological study. But still, it's, there's nothing that really comes up and slaps you in the face in terms of of cancers. We're just not seeing a high cancer incidence. Some of those guys that had very high levels of plutonium from those fires back in 1965 and, uh, and so on, some of those individuals are still alive today. And they're in their 80s and they're uh, you know, approaching 90, degree, uh, 90 years of age. We've got one individual that died here a couple of years ago. He was 86 or 87 years old. Had one of the highest doses of plutonium in his body of all the workers at Rocky Flats. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got a couple of others that were exposed way back in the 1950s, and both of those guys are still alive. And they've they've been, uh, you know, uh, it's so it's really hard, difficult to say, you know, that uh, that those standards weren't fairly fairly well selected by the people back in those days when mm -hmm. when they established those back in the 50s and 40s and 50s. Pre uh, did a pretty good job. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, when you get right down to it. The, the one that hit us is, is the beryllium, which has caused, uh, caused serious health effects in, in a lot of people. We've got a lot of people that uh, got a, over 130 individuals just at Rocky Flats alone, Rocky former Flats. Rocky Flats workers that have chronic beryllium disease and another 200 and, uh, 240 or so that are sensitized. Their blood tests are coming out sensitized. And now we've got facilities, uh, you know, I'm working with people at Portsmouth, Ohio, and uh, working with people at Hanford, uh, people at uh, at Oak Ridge, uh, uh, 
uh, the various facilities. They've asked me to come in and do assessments of their programs. Uh, there was an investigation. They, the headquarters asked me to come uh, on an investigation team uh, on an issue up at Hanford uh, and uh, on beryllium. And um, beryllium is the one that has really caught us. It's, it's the one that has really caused a serious problem and we can't put our heads in the sand. It's a, we have to face the music and, uh, and fess, uh, face the situation that uh, we caused some health problems and that's the reason why why uh, David Michaels and some of us felt that the right thing was to establish this workers' compensation program to to uh, to uh, do the right thing by the workers that have been affected by health issues. And uh, do you did you see David Michaels and other people like yourself as being instrumental in getting the the uh, the act through Congress? I mean. Well, I think did it take that push to do it? I think it took David Michaels and a bunch of those people back there, uh, uh, Ms. O'Leary and uh, and some of the others uh, there in Washington. Uh, there were a lot of people to, that uh, that deserve the credit for that, uh, putting that legislation through. And I, I think, I, you know, it could have been done better. It, uh, um, the Rocky Flats workers, I think, really. In my feeling, the Rocky Flats workers got the short end of the stick on it. But they're going back and they're trying to rectify that now in some respects. Uh, this special exposure cohort that, uh, that's being worked on right now, I don't know whether it's going to fly or not, but, but um, I, I think it's the right thing if, we, uh, if it can, can, be, uh, can be done. Because, uh, because our workers are the workers that really did hands-on work. Of all the facilities in the entire United States, our guys are the guys that did hands-on work, were, really had, um, our population was the one that uh, had the highest number of people that really did have exposure, measurable exposure. We can see it in their urinary excretion. We can see it in their lung counts. You know, we've got several thousand people that we can measure the number of atoms being excreted in their urine. We can measure it. And so uh, these guys are the guys that we really need to, need to um, give credit to and, and um, really, really deserve to be protected or given, given uh, not protected, but given the uh, appropriate um, uh, health um, uh, rewards if, if, there, if that can be done. How does it feel to you? This is your last day. Last day. <laughs> I wanted to thank you for taking time on your last day. How does it feel to kind of come to closure here? It sounds like you're going to move on and not be totally retired, but uh, well, but, pretty much retired. Hopefully, uh -huh. uh, um, there's a lot of mixed emotion. Uh -huh. A lot of mixed yeah. emotion. Yeah. Yeah. It. Um, you know, it's, it's time. I've put in my years of 39 years here, uh, and, but, uh, but by the same token, I, you know, I don't feel like I've done everything that I could have done. I, there are a lot of things I would have liked to have done uh, uh, for the workers, uh, but, but I, feel, I feel real good about what, what has done, uh, taken place, what, what little I've been able to contribute. I feel good about and um, feel like it's, uh, um, but I feel like it's time the plant is just about closed. I, I saw it grow, I saw buildings built, and now I've seen them taken back down again, and, um, and it's, uh, it's time to move on. And, uh, and I'll be 68 this fall, and it's, uh, it's time for me to back off and start uh, start uh, enjoying my grandkids and my family. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. a lot of mixed emotion to it. Yes. Yeah. There is. Yeah. Do you have any particular thoughts uh, or reflections on um, resumption of doing the work elsewhere, like at Los Alamos, that was done here, the making of the pits? Does that uh, do you think this is likely that it will happen? Do you have feelings about it one way or another? Unfortunately, I do think that 
first of all, I think, uh, you know, and, and I'm speaking strictly for myself and not for DOE or anybody right, else. Right, but yes. Personally, I think it was a mistake to have closed Rocky Flats in the first place because I do feel it's going to, Rocky Flats is going to have to be rebuilt someday. The production levels that other facilities are trying to do right now don't even muster anything. I mean, they can't, the facilities that are being, trying to build weapons or replace weapons in the, in the weapons system right now can't make enough weapons in, in a year's time to match what we, our guys were doing in a week. And, uh, you know, it's, in fact, we, we, we turned out enough weapons in, in one, one, uh, one day's time out here that a lot of these facility, uh, uh, facilities that we now have today, and the art has been lost. It, production of nuclear weapons, the handling of the plutonium, the chemistry of plutonium was something that you can't write down in a recipe book. You can't, it, there it was an art that these guys developed as they worked with this over the years and watched the chemistry process and watched the color changes and so on to know exactly when it was time to stop the reaction and, and this sort of thing. And it's not something that you can pass on to by, by anything other than experience and, and that knowledge is lost. And, um, and I think it's a shame it, it was lost. And, but I think, and I'm, I'm just worried that, that we haven't seen the end of it with the third world countries coming on as they come up, as North Korea, as, as uh, Pakistan, and all the other countries that, uh, uh, that are in Iran, Iran and Iraq. Uh, now, we've, Iraq we don't have to worry about now, but, but so much, but, uh, but Iran and some of the other countries, the uh, third world countries. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just afraid that, uh, that someday we are going to have to rebuild the Rocky Flats, and uh, where it will be, only time will tell. But, uh, but I do, and the problem is that the money that we put into Rocky Flats and then the money we took to tear it back down again, another facility, the equivalent of Rocky Flats, we had a, a drop in the bucket cost because the cost of buildings back in those days was down here. Now to rebuild Rocky Flats is going to take billions and billions and billions of dollars to do it and then they may still not be very successful. Not as successful as Rocky Flats ever was. Hmm. And so I, I think it's a, I, I think someday they're probably gonna have to replace Rocky Flats and I don't think they're ever gonna be able to replace it to, uh, totally that, uh, to the level that, uh, that it uh, ever existed now. But it did its job, it was a deterrent and, they, and uh, Thank heavens we never had to use any of those weapons um, uh, that we produced here at Rocky Flats, but at the same time, it, uh, it was a deterrent and uh, it has uh, impacted the world. Are there other things that we haven't covered, uh, either before or today, that you, you think would be, you know, you'd want to talk about? Um, well, I think we covered quite a bit. Uh, I, we, we did, yeah. I think we sort of covered most of the things that I had. I, I didn't ask you about um, your own perceptions. There's been so much in the press about, and the media in general, about the wildlife refuge and mm -hmm. is it going to be safe and that oh, sort of yes. thing. Could you speak to that issue? You know, first of all, how do you feel about? it yeah. being a wildlife refuge. I think it's great. Um, I think it's a great idea to, to keep that. There are some very, very unique ec ecological conditions out there at Rocky Flats. It's uh, that, you know, the, the long, uh, the tall and the short uh, blue stem growing together. It's the only place in the world that we know of that, uh, where that is occurring. And it's natural. It's naturally occurring. It, uh, uh, they're just as a, it's a. It's such a beautiful um, ecological area, 
and I think it's great to maintain that and keep it and preserve it to keep it from uh, from because if if you were to release this back to landowners or something like this, you know it's going to have development within within a few years. There's going to be houses built out there, and I, and from a safety standpoint, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, the amount of radioactivity that's in the soils, especially now that we are, you know, the DOE is going to is going to preserve that industrial area where there might be a l uh, some contamination still down deep down in the uh, in the soil, but the um, but the rest of the area is very very safe. I mean, it uh, it's only a very fraction the radioactivity. That's the radioactivity that's in the soils and uh, out there on the rest of the site are just a mere small minuscule fraction of the radioactivity that's there naturally occurring uranium, ura radium, thorium, and so on that's already in the soils. It's been there for eons of time, for thousands of years. And, uh, you know, there's thousands of times as much radioactivity naturally occurring as there is from the plutonium that's uh, left behind. And so from a health standpoint, there's no, there is no health issue. It, it really isn't an issue. I, I you know, I... Especially if, if the industrial if, site if, is... Especially if the industrial site is, is protected, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so I really, I, I feel that uh, it's, it's, the, it's the right thing to do, preserve that area, let the wildlife have uh, have run of it, and uh, and just uh, protect the uh, inner area from uh, pe anybody coming in there and digging down into the deep down into the soils. Uh, um, the surface is fine. There's no problem uh, on the surface of the industrial area. That's that's fine. But uh, I I wouldn't want to see people going in there and digging a a, a well shaft or digging a big foundation that goes down 10 feet deep into the into, the, into some of those areas. I think it, uh, that would be a mistake. Yeah. How are they going to protect that industrial area? It's going to be maintained. Um, it's, uh, I, um, I'm not sure whether they're going to have it fenced off. I think, it, I think, it's, uh, I think that's intention is to have mm -hmm. it fenced off and, uh, and then uh, uh, pre uh, kept, kept as a, a preserved area. And DOE will continue to monitor that area. Um, that's mm -hmm. what part of the part of the uh, turnover that's taking place from from the cleanup now is turning it over to long uh, to the long term uh, legacy management to uh, to monitor and continue to to protect that area. Mm -hmm. and, and the wildlife people are going to be be uh, doing controlling of some of that too. Yeah. Do you have any uh, reactions to the, I think there's a bill in the state legislature put forth by um, the, uh, the fellow that was on the grand jury, McKinley. Oh yeah. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that, that bill or that kind of legislation? I think it's I think it's inappropriate. I think it's a scare tactic uh, that it, it does undo scare of the of the population of the public uh, because it's if he only understood that uh, you know the the radioactivity from plutonium is is a very small minuscule quantity of of what's out there uh, originally. Uh, it doesn't make any sense, uh, it, you know, and to to go putting placards up that. Uh, that that don't mean anything because uh, uh, you know from as a health physicist and measuring measuring background radiation around here in Colorado, I can take a sample here and go up uh, Coal Creek Canyon or just move over a few yards over and get differences of uh, readings of gamma radiation, let alone the alpha radiation and uh, and and so the variability of the amount of radioactivity. I mean. If, if you're afraid of rocky flats, the soils of rocky flats, especially the soils out in the, uh, any of that soil, then you, you better stay out of the mountains because I can take you up in Central City, up there around the uh, graveyards, uh, the, the cemetery 
of Central City where the flowers are actually mutated and different. Uh, they're, the flowers, the petals on the flowers are mutated uh, and uh, the miracles, uh, uh, Dr. and Mrs. Miracle from uh, Michigan State University uh, studied these back years and years and years ago, uh, several decades back. Um, the flowers have, have uh, purple blotches on them and so forth and it's from the radioactivity in the soil. The thorium, Nat naturally, naturally occurring thorium. thorium because it's a natural radio, uh, what we call a natural dike where the crusts of the earth have been pushed up and, and you take a Geiger uh, counter up there, or some of these folks take a Geiger counter up there, they might not stop running till they hit the Kansas border uh, because uh, the amount of radioactivity is pretty darn high. I've been up there and done some measurements on that and, uh, and uh, y y there are a lot of areas like that around here in the, in the Rocky Mountains where veins of uh, naturally occurring this radioactive thorium and uranium and so forth with thousands and millions of years of half-life, far longer half-lives than plutonium has. Naturally occurring uranium has billions of years of half-life. I mean, it's, they're just in the comparison and yet, uh, and yet people get scared here uh, with this little tiny minuscule quantity which, uh, where the radioactivity is 1,000 or 2,000 times higher in the naturally occurring there on the site than, than the plutonium, so. That sort of reminds me, it, it seems, sounds to me as though from uh, where you started with your early studies, uh, <laughs> nuclear studies, you then had to move in a sense away from that to beryllium and the chemical, is that? So it's, been a, it's been an in interesting trip. because. Uh -huh. <laughs> I started Does it out seem like a, you've moved away from that, or uh, well, to some extent, uh -huh. uh, you know, it still plays a role. And but uh, it's but I've um, gone from nuclear physics and so on, uh, uh, all the way through biological, medical, uh, medical aspects, and medical studies, radiation cytogenetic studies, uh, epidemiological studies. Uh, uh, doing uh, doing pathology, doing uh, uh, autopsies on individuals, and uh, and moving all the way through, and um, and then into beryllium, and uh, and uh, but at the same time, like the last about the la the last number of years, I've been program manager for DOE uh, for uh, uh, the occupational medicine for beryllium program manager of beryllium and program manager of radiation protection and. Uh, and uh, so the radiation side of it is, has continued to go on. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the areas like beryllium and so on is, uh, has come up to where it uh, it's, takes just about as much of my time or probably and almost better known for my knowledge, uh, work with beryllium than I am with radiation, even though my doctoral studies were on that translocation dynamics of plutonium and, the, and americium. And, uh, and uh, the studies of uh, studies of the health uh, health um, uh, um, health risks and so on. That, uh, but I've uh, I've diversed a great deal, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> diversified. Yeah. Looking back, I, I know that you said last time, you know, you kind of compared your work to that of a, a physician, actually. Uh, and looking back, do, do you? Uh, do you know why you chose this route rather than becoming a physician, or is well, just one of those accidental things? I came very close to uh, I, uh, when I got I came out of my doctoral uh, research. Uh, one of the fellows tried to talk me into going into either me uh, occupational medicine, going ahead and uh, getting a degree in oc medicine, or or getting a degree in veterinary medicine, one or the other. And uh, I came very close to it. In fact, my doctor's degree is from the School of Veterinary Medicine at Colorado State University. It's uh, the, my doctor's degree in radiation biology actually is under the School of Veterinary Medicine, and uh, took a lot of courses uh, along that line and in, uh, in physiology and so forth. And so I, but I, I didn't want to put my family through any further. I, I, I had. Three child, my third child was born when I was um, when I was in graduate school on my master's program before I even came to Rocky Flats, 
and then then I had the three kids and so on now when I was going through my doctoral and uh, and I, I and I put them through an awful lot and um, and I just didn't want to didn't want to push uh, push it any further I felt like I I needed to um, and, and I didn't want to stay away from Rocky Flats that long either. Uh, I really wanted to get back and get back with wor with the workers. I felt a real a real strong um, need to get back to to working with the workers and trying to trying to do what I could to protect the workers. And and so I really had a had a burning burning desire to get back and uh, get back to back here to working directly with the production workers. And, and so I chose not to go ahead and uh, go further at that time. And it, and I feel like the, we've had some real good medical physicians here, and I worked within the medical department. I, when I came back here, I, uh, in 1980, they transferred me to the occupational medicine department, and I established a, a, a group which I call the health effects group. And uh, actually, that's the group that grew and um, and took over the research that I was doing on the former radiation worker medical monitoring program, and the former beryllium uh, beryllium surveillance program, and and the current beryllium surveillance program. So um, about all of it. All of that I, I established back in, back in, in while I was in the medical department, and uh, when I. Actually, when I first went over to the medical department, the very first thing I did was I established, I, I, a couple of us were put in charge of put, putting together a computer system, and I, uh, I did all the programming and wrote the program for, um, for establishing an, a, 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 a computerized medical information system and, and computerizing all our medical record system at Rocky Flats. Uh, and uh, did that in the night in 1983 and 84, 85 time frame, and wrote the programs and everything for that, and, uh, and then went back to, uh, while I was doing all these other things, and <laughs> so so it's been a varied uh, a varied history. Um, uh, had my fingers in a lot of things. I a lot of times feel like a jack of all trades and master at none, <laughs> but. Uh, been very blessed. And, uh, I have so, to. The good Lord has really blessed me throughout these years. I, I really have to give him credit. So now you're going to retire some, but you're going to keep your hand in. It sounds. Well, like. I might. I, I I haven't made a complete commitment to that. Um, I possibly will and do a little bit of consulting uh, on that. I've been asked to. Uh, to um, consult some on, on the, with the uh, with the uh, uh, employee workers comp program uh, nation nas at the national level headquarters. Some of the people in headquarters have said, "Baseline, you can't retire without at least agreeing to to be willing to con do consulting on beryllium because because uh, that is one area that um, worldwide, I guess, I've sort of become." Known as one of the world's experts on beryllium, and so they, uh, there, there's a lot of pressure to to um, continue to provide some expertise uh, on beryllium and cleaning up facilities. How to go about cleaning up for, uh, beryllium contaminated facilities and how to protect workers and so forth and so. So I may continue to to dabble a little bit, but I. I do want to retire. I'm tired, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and do want to en enjoy the family and uh, and um, grandkids and all, and do a little traveling if at all possible. Uh -huh. Now I think you're going to. I heard that you were going to retire to a family farm in well, Kansas, where you were. <laughs> I um, my my grandparents homesteaded a property uh, outside of Abilene, Kansas, east of Abilene, just outside the, uh, about four miles east of Abilene. I-70 goes right through the middle of the property and splits it in two. Um, and they homesteaded that back in the 1880s, and um, we have the old original homestead deed signed by P 
President Benjamin Harrison. <clears throat> and um, while I was back, my sisters, a couple of my sisters are having some health problems. And, and um, last summer, my wife and I were back there um, talking with the sisters and kind of making arrangements to take over the seeing, uh, seeing, looking after the farm. And while we were there, we found a, an old, um, an old historic Victorian mansion in, in town that uh, I used to march past it when I was, back when Eisenhower declared for the presidency. Uh, I marched in the parade past that house uh, in the, uh, when he was there in town uh, announcing his candidacy for the president. And uh, I still remember as a, a high school student marching past there at fair time and so on. And, yeah. and it was a for sale and uh, he ended up buying it. And uh, oh, I used to drool over that house. <laughs> but uh, so we're going back there and uh, gonna gonna retire back in the town of Abilene and uh, try to try to enjoy our, our uh, latter years of life. <laughs> And you have many grandchildren? Or? I've got eight grandchildren at uh -huh. present time, yes. I have eight grandchildren uh, scattered from one side of the country to the other. Uh, California to stepson living in Washington, D.C. and, and uh, son, uh, two sons in uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco. and So they're, they're spread out all over the place. Uh, <clears throat> so. And in between. <laughs> Well, um, is there anything else that you would like to say, or you well, just kind of? I, I think we've covered uh, just about everything that I okay. had uh, had noted. Uh, good, good. Uh -huh. is, that uh, okay. uh, I think uh, that's relevant and important. Okay, maybe we should stop. All right, now thank then. you.